The 49ers is one of those lucky teams that's had different eras of greatness, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where oh, Joe you, Montana you, said right, you win. Yeah. You win five of them, and then you go, and you have like a second iteration where you're a dominant you team up. again, you know? No Shanahan come in. Yeah, not everybody gets that. Motherfucker put three tight ends back on the field, everybody nut up. Man, turn around, hand, <laughs> turn around and hand it off. People can't figure it out. <laughs> guys, it's a run play. I'd be like, hey, guys, they're running a zone. <laughs> just stop them. Try and do it hey, 40 times a game. Hey, Get in your gap. Yeah, just. As soon as you stick you on it, they're going to stick that ball out right here. And then they have George Kittle deep crossing. George Kittle about to run about 17 minutes over. <laughs> they lean on Debo a lot. Trent Williams. He hell. So he's better at left tackle than everybody else at their position. <laughs> yeah, their position. I, you probably got it he's right. He's a 99 on Madden. Yeah. yeah. Because you can't be that big him, and Because they put him in motion. And though. they pull it. They, they put, yeah. But they put him in motion. Yeah. And Somebody hit the little, the little end. He's so light on his feet when yeah. he was coming out of the tunnel with Debo dancing. Yeah. When they used to go hoop got in uh, Washington when he was there, he used to bring it up. You know how most time when you play with like big the, man the big cat, they had to play with the big cat. Trent Williams ain't run the point. Okay. Wow. Trent Williams ran the point. Point guard. Man, ain't no way. What up, brother? Oh, how you doing, man? How you feeling? Uh, how you doing, baby? Yeah, that's up, man. Go. Yeah, man. What's up, legend? Yeah, good? Yeah, good. Yeah, good? All right, y'all. Walking around, like, y'all niggas get y'all work here. Like, we, we straight. Well, JT, Zach, and Junior and them early on, they be in the drill, but they really wouldn't do it hard, but yeah. they was just there. Now they just be like, y'all don't need that shit. Hey, me and Troy. Yeah, them tap all the shots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, back up. One on one tackle. And I'm in there and hitting five. Yeah, you had to. Yeah. The dude and, running and, the and ball right hard. About. Yeah. I was like, Coach, can I tag off? You better not tag off. Keep doing your thing, man. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Hi. Come, yeah, keep man. giving it, dog. Yeah. We watch them every day. This is all he lets us watch. <laughs> I don't even be here, man. Look, I'm blessed to be here, dog. I don't even. You I, that's passion. That's passion. Right, 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 right. I watch y'all shit all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just saying, bro. For sure, bro. Yeah, appreciate that. We just keep working, dog. Correct. That's all we're doing. You knock motherfucking sleep. That's what I like. Yeah, that little cute shit nowadays. Yeah, I appreciate y'all, though, man. For sure, man. Yeah, keep going, dog. Oh yeah, yeah. Help a brother out. Good luck this year. Oh yeah, that's it. Appreciate that, my dog. Come, come, come and holler at the man. Reenact a few. Reenact a few plays. Yeah. What's going on, friend? T, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. Nice to see you guys. Yeah. We got some stories. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll have a good time talking. Yeah. My man, good to see you again, brother. How you doing, brother? Yes, sir. Good to see you again. Good, good, good. When I see other safeties, I realize how little I was. I realized Lynch was just big. Yeah, I realized I wasn't big enough to do the job the right way. Herm was up here for Taylor Swift. He brought his daughters up the other night. He and I were back there. Oh, did you go? Oh, oh yeah. You went too? Oh, yeah. I, we have three daughters, uh -huh. but two of them were here, and they weren't not going. So, And <laughs> because Herm was there, I went. It's actually pretty damn good. That, that, that girl can. She held that crowd around that three and a half hours. They never sat. Man. They know every word. Yeah. It was actually pretty cool. I saw just, like, joy on people's. She's got something special and she to sold her. out, like, multiple nights in different cities. Oh, yeah. gosh. People were yeah. going to see her like two and three times. From other places going yeah. in. Yeah, man. I, I heard, uh, so I saw a few articles where the city officials, they talk about her presence, what it does to their local economy. economy. It's crazy. Yeah. Coach is a Swifty. You a Swifty. I'm a Swifty. <laughs> <laughs> Hold up. Limitless. Take a sim and cap in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a sim and cap in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. Well, thank you so much for your time during training camp, for what you've accomplished to give us an opportunity to be here. I think it's amazing. You are putting together two Hall of Fame careers in, in different areas, uh, much like Ozzie Newsom was able to do as the Baltimore GM. Obviously, Chan, Fred, and myself, we thank you. I want to go back to something that's probably not necessarily the greatest football question or GM question. You said that Linda wrote you letters for every game that you played 
and also well, the color commentary for. Does she write them still, Coach, as the GM? Oh, that ship has sailed. <laughs> <laughs> I wish she would. For the beat, for the, it's got to be a real big one. But I'll tell you what, you guys know it. Um, you know, when you, when you have spouses, when you have families, they, they go on this ride with you. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate and blessed not only to, to marry the love of my life, my best friend, but she kind of got it. First of all, she had four brothers. Recommend it to anyone who's marrying someone. <laughs> four brothers is a good thing. They kind of taught her the ropes. Uh, second of all, she was a collegiate athlete. She played on the tennis tour for a little bit, so she knew what I was going through. And, you know, people laugh, but I tell them, like, you know, when I was studying, she would, she was the one asking me questions on flashcards. And so she was very invested in it and extremely supported. And I'll never forget John Madden. Somehow one of my teammates told him that you know, if you look over before a game, Lynch is reading notes. And we always wondered what they were. And they found me out. And... I started having success as a player, and so they were laughing at me at first. Then I started having success. Next thing you know, I look over before the game, and every damn person in that locker room <laughs> reading a note. <laughs> but, you know, Madden asked me one time, what is she saying? Is it lovey-dovey? You know, it's only John Madden. I said, no, it's actually stuff like key the guards, <laughs> read your keys, because she was the one doing all the flashcards. And <laughs> I all love that. it, Coach. But it always just kind of settled me uh, before a game. Uh, also, I, I used to think about them every time I, I stepped on a field. Herm Edwards he used to say, autograph your performance, Litchburg. And to me, that meant you're representing a lot of people. You're rep not only your team, your teammates, you're representing your family. I always wanted to make them proud. So I get, I, even right here, you know, um, that's something special to me because she cared. She, she, they went to most of my games. Um, she, was, she, was, she was in it. And... Uh, even when I took this thing, you know, that was a big deal. I had a pretty good life <laughs> yeah, coach. Yeah. as a broadcaster and all that. And I had to get everyone on board. But like always, she said, well, is this in your heart? Well, then let's go do it, you know, and we've done it together. Yeah, so uh, the story has it is that you were afraid to tell her that you took the job because you took it before telling her. Well, you got good sources. <laughs> yeah, I got a few good sources. Yeah. She said, is it in your heart and all that? It took a little while because right. she knew what a commitment this would be. And we had kids in high school. A recommendation to anyone, never move a girl who's a senior in high school. And I'm still paying for that one. And thank God <laughs> she's, she's a good sport. Um, but she left a boyfriend and all that. And uh, it's tough. But I think that's, you know, the story that w when we go do this, it's not just us. It's our families. And, and it takes a lot of sacrifice and a lot of commitment from everyone. And, and I, I've been very blessed. Uh, not only with the parents who raised me, but the family, um, you know, got four unbelievable kids and, and uh, you know, they've, they've been very much part of this journey. And coach, why would you do this, John? Because you yeah. played all pro. I'm sure those four kids aren't struggling to eat dinner at night. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm sure the Lynch family is set financially. Yeah. Like, why would you jump back into 12 plus hour days? You know, I really think playing ball and playing the position I played where you, where you got to go next play and you got to forget what happened. I was able to rest my head at night and feel pretty good. You know, you've given it everything you can. And as long as you're doing that, you're living right. You know, I can, I could lay my head, do head down and, and feel good, but something was tugging at me. I didn't know what it was. And, you know, I had been exposed to it uh, a bit by my friend John Elway. He had, you know, John and I went to Stanford about 10 years ahead of, a, of me. I went there as a quarterback. I had played for his high school coach, and so there was some connection. And I w when I moved to Denver, he looked out for me. And uh, when I retired, uh, started playing golf with him, and then he took the leap into running the Broncos. And, uh, you know, somewhere down the line, he said, Johnny, you know, I'm doing this, and I'm, I'm working with a lot of people that I've never worked with. Uh, we talk ball all the time. Would you help me out? I say, yeah, but, you know, what, what do you want me to do? He said, just take the safeties this year wow. and write them up. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know how to write a report. He goes, sure you do. You know football, just write what you see. And so I took the safeties uh, that year, and I'll never forget. It was like Mark Barron, Harrison Smith, yep. whatever that year was. I mean, some good players, and I wrote them and took a lot of pride in how I wrote them, and John was impressed. So the next year, uh, he said, hey, take take the entire DB stack. And I was broadcasting, so it was great practice for me to stay in practice, study college players, and I, I love watching it just like you guys do. And so I did the entire DBs. The next year, he says, why don't you come in-house and see what it's all about? And so I went and I did. John Fox was the head coach. Uh, Elway was there. And I went 
and sat in draft meetings and went to the combine and and did the whole deal with the Broncos and that kind of got me going and um, kind of a, a yearning for man I miss a scoreboard uh, mm. I I do a broadcast and would feel really good about it and and communicating my love for the game and knowledge for the game with people but something was pulling at me and I finally figured out that's what it was and and that led to me calling Kyle Shanahan when I thought he was going to get this job and just saying hey man you know. I don't know if you'd ever be interested, but it sounds like you're going to get that San Francisco job. Uh, you know, I've admired you from afar. I've called a lot of your games. Um, but if you'd ever be interested, you know, I think I'd like to be a GM. And I remember him saying, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> you got a good life. You right. know, you do. I, I know you're really good at the, the broadcast. You know, at least I think so. And I don't know that world. Like, why would you do it? And uh and, and then he called back about two hours later and he said, man, I'm not trying to talk you out of it because I would love it. Like, let's right. keep talking. And next thing you know, I get a call from the owner here saying, hey, fly on up here. I'd like to talk to you. I talked to Kyle. Next thing you know, I'm on a flight cross country going to meet with Kyle. Uh, we we decided in that meeting we're going to do this thing. And, and the rest is history. So That's amazing. Pretty cool. Anybody who knows me well knows that John Lynch has basically lived the life I want to live. Right. <laughs> I want it to be a hard hitting Safety, I'm um, doing TV now, and eventually that's the job I would love to have. I would love to have an opportunity, like you said, to be able to see the scoreboard again and walk home, whether I won or lost, knowing where I fared that week. And I think you're doing an absolutely amazing job. I'm going to backtrack a little bit, though, because I love the way you played the game. I just do. And so many times, and I know you see it, your phone call on draft night, changes people's entire mm -hmm. lives. Not just the guys you call, but their families and their generations after them. He spoke of your Lynch set of kids eating. You were also eating well too. Back when, you know, your, your father and, you know, where you guys lived and you guys were affluent and you were getting to go see Air Coriel and all <laughs> of these different things in San Diego, a quarterback. All right, you had Denny Green and Bill Walsh to kind of mentor you. But I heard your pops was like a mother effer, bro. I, that, that, <laughs> you, you know, you're playing Notre Dame. You get a little banged up. Concussion protocol was not yeah. what it is yeah. today. And your pop encourages you, and maybe not the nicest way, to get back out. You pop Jerome Bettis. He fumbles. You pick off Rick Meyer. And everybody knows Stanford, Notre Dame is, is a big deal. Talk a little bit, man, about what inspired you and the reasons you went so hard at football when it wasn't necessarily something you needed to do to have a good life. Yeah, I think my parents, um, you know, so my dad, he, he grew up with not a lot, you know, and made a success of himself. Was 11th round pick of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The other best organization in the world. Oh, coach, yeah, that, by that's the way. right. I, I can't argue with that, man. <laughs> but that's, that's one of those iconic organizations, man. And my love for it will always be there because my dad was drafted there. I'll never forget. I was doing one of your games and uh, was in there with Mike and everything. And, and Mr. Rooney, Dan, came in. And, uh, you know, I never really heard of my dad as a player because he just had a cup of coffee. And uh, he came in and he said, you know, your dad got hurt, but he was one hell of a player. Wow. And uh, that was pretty cool for me. And, uh, you know, my parents raised us with good values and they raised us, um, you know, with hard work. You know, it, we were lynches. We didn't we didn't get C's. You know, mm -hmm. you don't miss school. Um, you know, we go to work. He took me to the Boys and Girls Club. He wanted me to grow up and and. The other thing, he didn't come into money until I was about a freshman in high school, so I wasn't always used to that. <laughs> um, but he wasn't going to raise soft kids, and that's that's yeah. my older sister, uh, my younger brother. He taught us good old-fashioned values, and um, you know, I'm always he was always there. That's that's one cool thing. He built a big radio company and uh, started in sales, and ended up owning a big broadcast company where where they had 26 radio stations at one point across the country. And I remember what I remember most about my dad, he's building this company. So he had to go to New York a lot and raise money, but he was always my little league coach. He didn't coach me in football. He coached me in baseball. And I'd be looking like right before the game, because if he wasn't there, I didn't feel right. And inevitably, sometimes it was five minutes, sometimes it was right after the first pitch, but he'd come running out of that car and he was there. So whether you grow up rough, whether you grow up with, with some privilege, um, you know, I, I think, there's something innate and I think there's something learned in how you're raised. And I always innately, I, I like competing and I, I like, 
I liked winning so much to the, you know, that uh, a lot of time when he's my little league coach, I was sitting because I'd throw my helmet. <laughs> and I remember my mom really panicking, like, John, what's wrong with him? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and much like your coach used to say, Ryan, uh, Mike Tomlin, you know, he talks a lot about, we were talking about practice with Chan and Fred mm -hmm. about, man, we, these guys come, they, yeah. they're old school. And sometimes right. we got to pull them back. And Mike says, it's a lot easier to teach Wove than it is sick them. Yes, sir. And that's what basically what my mom used to say, Kathy, wow. don't worry. It's, it's a good thing. We'll learn how to channel it, channel that energy. So I always had that. I never took anything for granted because I wasn't allowed to. I was expected to work hard in everything I did. And we, you know, we were, we were taught, my mom and dad, that you gave 100% if you were going to do something. They also taught us great values about giving back. And that's a responsibility, not just a nice thing to do. And when that's reinforced, when I get to the league by older players who I'm, who I'm trying to model or Tony Dungy, who talked a lot about that, those things stick with you. So. Since we're talking about the Steelers organization and Mike Tumlin, uh, talk about Mike, the, the yeah. winningest coach in the history of the game from a consecutive season standpoint. Your first time meeting with Mike when he was, <laughs> <laughs> when he was on the Tampa Bay staff. Oh, man. Um, do you remember that meeting? Yeah, yeah, I do. How, I remember it well. Go? You know, I was always a, a do-right, pretty coachable guy. But, um, you know, I, I don't think I was feeling myself, but... We, we had lost Herm Edwards. Herm went to be the, uh, the, the head coach of the New York Jets. And so there were big shoes to fill. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget being at the Pro Bowl. And this is old school, before there were cell phones. And so I came back up, and that blinking light you see in the hotel was blinking. And I also had a bunch of notes mm -hmm. I needed to call back to my facility, Tony Dungy. And I'm like, Linda, they're going to cut me at the Pro Bowl. Because <laughs> <You know, like, laughs> that's what I thought was happening. But instead, it was, hey, we finally... We got you a heck of a coach. And I said, well, that's awesome. Cause they had interviewed like 30 people. They knew they had big shoes to fill. When, you're, when you lose a Herm Edwards, you better bring someone with some teeth. And uh, we had myself and Rondé, we had some vets in there, Brian Kelly. And so they bring Mike Tomlin in and uh, Mike came in there uh, confident, ready, but then he takes us out for drills. And I, he wanted to change everything. Like he wanted, <laughs> he wanted me to put my hands on the ground when I, when I, when I was coming out of breaks, I said, I'm not doing that, man. <laughs> and and uh, so we butted heads for that mini camp. But at the end of mini camp, I was flying back to San Diego. I used to train in San Diego. And Mike came to me and, you know, the, the get better tapes that coaches yeah. give to players and say, hey, here's some things. And here's this brand new coach. Um, you know, I've just had these three days of kind of butting heads with him. And he gives me and he says, I want you to open this when you're on the plane back to San Diego. And I open it up. And man, there are four pages, like 72 plays of things I could do better. And I'm feeling myself coming off an old pro year right. and feeling really good about myself. And this guy's just eviscerating my game, you know, saying you got no pass rush skills. You, you've been bull rushing for 10 years. It's finally time we learned some pass rush wow. moves. And I was so mad. And I remember getting off the plane and my wife knew something was up. And she said, I told her what's up. And she goes, well, did you read it? I said, no, I got angry and I put it down. And she said, let's go home and read it. You right. know, so I went home and I read it and I said, I'll be damned. This guy's exactly right. Wow. And, uh, you know, that led to an unbelievable relationship and you appreciate people that first of all, have the knowledge to kind of dissect your game, but then the fortitude, to even though you're playing really well, say, you know what, I think you can even be better. And right. so that was the start of a great relationship, and I, I was I was so lucky. I mean, I think on that first Buck staff, Tony Dungy's our head coach, Monty Kiffin's the D coordinator, Rod Marinelli at D line, Lovey Smith at linebackers, and Herm Edwards at yeah. the defensive back coach. I mean, it was just it, it was something special, and uh, you know to to be able to go from a guy like Herm and then to go to Mike and Mike. Mike made me a better player at that stage of my career, and sometimes you need a little kick in the ass, and, yeah. and he Sam gave it to say me. You were pissed. Yeah. I was. <laughs> you know, Herm, Herm was awesome. Our D-line used to be over there working, but Herm had played, you know, so we'd do some individual, and then Herm said, all right, fellas, come on up here. We're going to have a little theory. <laughs> we'd, we'd be talking, looking at cards, and D-line would be so mad. Mike had us working uh, like college kids. and But, uh, you know, I know Rondé. Rondé is going to have him in Canton because he knows how much Mike had an influence on his life, and I'm, I'll forever be appreciative of Mike. The, the other part of that call... Tony and Monty were on the phone along with Rich McKay, our, our GM, and they said, we got good news and bad news. And I said, OK, what's the good news? And they said, we found you a heck of a coach, Mike Tomlin. You know, he, you know he's been, I think he most recently had, had been at Notre Dame. 
And I said, well, what's the bad news? And they said, you're two years older than him. <laughs> so well, I said, well, can he coach? And that's all I cared about. Right, and, right. Uh, you know, we got over that really quick because I knew he could help me get where I wanted to get. You also mentioned pitching. So you were drafted by the Marlins in the second round of the 92 draft. Yeah. I usually have on my Marlins hat every episode. <laughs> uh, but I just found out you threw out the first pitch in the organization's history, which is crazy to me. Why not? baseball. I was actually much more talented baseball player. I could always throw hard. I could always hit. And so that always came naturally. I honestly think, I talked about my dad and what a great influence he was. I think there's a part of every little boy who wants to be like their dad. And there was also a lot of naysayers in, in football. I was a quarterback and, you know, highly recruited and all that. But there was always a, yeah, but he should be playing baseball. And that kind of would motivate me all the more to want to go play football. And sure enough, I get drafted higher in baseball, and that happens mm -hmm. after my junior year. And quarterback didn't work out at Stanford. I was the number two, but I didn't want to do that anymore. My junior year, I go in, talk with Denny Green, and uh, he tells me to stay patient. I come back the next day. I said, I'm done being patient. <laughs> yeah. I'm either going to go play baseball and try to get really good at something, or we need to find me another position. And he tried again, but then he finally said, all right, where you want to play? Mm -hmm. And he said, how about linebacker? I said, no, safety. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I wanted to go play safety. So that was, that was the start of that. My heart was always in football, man. I, I tell people a lot, I love baseball. I was up late last night watching my pod race, <laughs> which is a tough deal right now. Yes, they got all this talent. <laughs> a lot of they talent. Can't, go, oh, <laughs> can't put it together. And I, I love baseball. I love everything about it. Played it at, at Stanford and, um, but man, to me, baseball is like football is all the time when it's 3-2 bases loaded. Mm -hmm. I, I just love that. I love the energy. I love, you talked about, we, we were season ticket holders at the Chargers growing up. And I remember sitting in the stands and how it would bring people together, black, white, rich, poor. They were Charger fans on that Sunday. And my dad was up doing radio. So he was usually entertaining up in a suite. And us three kids would sit down there. And those people were like our parents. They were like our family. We sat with them for, you know, seven, eight, nine years. And, and I, I always felt, and I think I really gravitated towards football because of its ability to bring people together. And to this day, that's one, one of the things I love most about it. And you talking about those names with the, with the Tomlins and the Kiffins and just historic coaches, Hall of yeah. Fame type coaches. But then the guys, like mm -hmm. Freddie's telling sap stories. He's talking about Rondé Barber. The names we're throwing out like they're just, you Brooks. know, normal names. D. Brooks is out there. At the time, what's the saying? You can't see the, the forest through the trees. Yeah. Did y'all know that? Because historically, what is it, 2,000 Ravens? He going to bring up his Steelers. Y'all were hell. Your yeah. Steelers team oh, was hell. I wasn't going to say anything. He going to bring it up. But that Steelers team, that Ravens team, oh, that, that Bucks team of two. Like, did y'all know y'all were that good at the time or y'all were just playing ball? By 02, we did. Uh, <laughs> prior to that, you know, you knew Sapp and Brooks were good. I mean, if you ever watched them play college football, yeah. those guys, those guys were ballers, man. And, you know, we were, people forget, um, you know, Sapp likes to say we took it from a third world country <laughs> to the Taj Mahal <laughs> because the Bucks were the yucks. You grew yeah, up in Florida, you grew yucks, up in yeah. Florida, man. There were some lean years and I came in there in 93, Sam Weish. I go to, I go to the Bucks and I don't have success right away. Uh, back then, unless you were a top pick, you usually kind of bought your time, played special teams. I did it. But like going into my third year, I hadn't been a full-time starter and finally figured it out in my third year and they gave me opportunity and I started ascending. But then all of a sudden that 95 draft, I'm sitting back and Warren's slipping and Warren said, I'm saying, please, please go get this kid. <laughs> please go get that. And bam, Warren, Warren Sapp. And then all of a sudden we got another pick in the first round I didn't know as much about Brooks, but I had seen some tape. And I remember this undersized linebacker that was flying around and killing people. And I'll never forget after we drafted him being in, Johnny Lynn was our DB coach and I was at the facility and those guys, you know how they fly the top top first round picks. And we came in this room and Brooks was just nodding his head like he does. <laughs> and Sap comes in. You're that hard ass white boy that be knocking people out. <laughs> and he Sounds says, like he says, you ready to go? And I said, let's go. And I knew it was going to be fun right about then. And then it took a lot of hard work though. They had, they had lost for so long there. You had to, you had to get rid of man, all that losing culture. And the best thing they could have done was bring in young guys like that. And, um, you know, it wasn't always easy because there were vets that, that, you know, had lost for a long time and kind of were just collecting checks. And we had to kind of take over that team. And fortunately, those guys, um, they gave us, gave us the ability to do that. Um, 
the thing that I love most about that group is the way we play. Uh, mm -hmm. Some really talent, and now there'll be four guys in the Hall of Fame. We played with guys like Simeon Rice and the role players, Greg Spires. I mean, people forget about the role players, Shelton Corals, Brian Kelly, all these guys. Old school. They were, they were great players, man. We held each other accountable. And, like, man, I, I, I tell people, you talk about people running to the ball. That was kind of all our hallmark. Mm -hmm. And we'd start every practice. Nowadays, the, the health and performance guy would come grab you off the field because pursuit drill, that's how we started. They'd toss it, and we'd all turn and run. And there was yeah. Marinelli and, and Lovey, and there was either thumbs up if everyone was sprinting through the line. <laughs> I'm good. talking D lineman, too, or yeah. boom, and you had to go back in that Florida heat. <laughs> Man, but that forged us. We played the right way. Really, really proud of that group. John, you got to the pinnacle of the game as a player. Yeah. And there's a feeling that comes from that of, of accomplishment because everybody wants to do great individually. But when you mention the type of names that you have to accomplish that goal together and what is a brotherhood and a family in that locker room is amazing. As you take over as the GM, you know, trying to figure out things with Kyle late in the season, you get an opportunity to get Jimmy G. You guys have struggled to that point. He wins five straight. You do a great job of signing him. You, know, you have some injuries, some things happen, and then you get there against Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. You're probably a post route away from, from winning the Super Bowl. What was that feeling like for you, feeling like, man, we really put it together in the, in the image that we wanted. We're right there and just not finishing the game after three and a half really good quarters. What was that feeling like walking off the field that day? Yeah, it lives in here and it lives in here. And uh, I think that's why I'm still here. Otherwise, I would have taken that broadcast money that they came <laughs> last year, you know, had I won one. But, man, I, I really enjoy this first and foremost. And then, um, you know, when I signed up for this, I came to this organization because it was one I always admired. And we had an owner who was going to allow us to do things the way we wanted to do it. And I had a head coach that I, that I felt could be special and then have had the opportunity to work with him and he's even more than I could ever have anticipated. I knew he's an offensive genius. I didn't know how he'd lead. He, he's, a, he's a special cat and uh, you know we've we've grown really close putting this thing together. We spend a ton of time together. We challenge each other um, but those things never go away. Just like the 1999, I, I have nightmares of Ricky Prohl catching. <laughs> we bring four week and, and, and Kurt Warner Runs a hitch and go to Ricky Pro yep. in the back of the end zone. I think his first touchdown that entire year, Ricky was a heck of a player. And, uh, you know, those things, they never go away. And so you're fueled by them. And I'm having a blast doing this, man. It is really fun. And, uh, you know, you're trying to find the Sapses, the Brooks. Yeah. You're trying to find the Rondé Barbers. It's a real fun process. And I, I'm proud of the way we do it. We've, we've got a, you know, a lot of places there's friction um, between management and the coaching staff. Uh, I think it's my nature. Uh, you know, I talk a lot about bringing people together. That's the way I like to roll. And, you know, being a game analyst, I, you know, one, one great lesson I got, you know, I think is getting a real global outlook at the league as players. You know how you did it in Jacksonville. You were there for a long time. You know the Steelers. We all know where we've been, but people, you don't know a whole lot. I knew how they did it in Tampa, how they did it in Denver. Being a game analyst, I'd go on the road every Friday, get to meet with head coaches, get to talk with GMs. And the places that were successful, everyone worked together. The places where perennial losers and all that, um, that the head coach was going, man, if I had any players, and the GM was going, if they just coached them up. <laughs> and, and, you know, you go up to Seattle, and John, John Schneider and Pete Carroll are kind of boxed up. They're, yeah, they're, they're completing each other's sentences when one's not there, and they're <laughs> speaking the same language. And so it's not, that's not brain surgery. Right. Uh, you got to work together. It's hard enough. And, and, but those, you know, things like that, that Mahomes loss, I mean, it makes you go back and say, okay, we got to get better. As good as that team was, we got to find a way to get better. And we, we keep it, we keep adding the right type of guys, talented guys and feel really good about this team, but we got to go do it. John, you have put together, I was talking to Kyle about it. You probably have the best all around tight end in football in Kittle. You have the best left tackle in the world. Running back, linebacker, Fred Warner, Talanoa, backside. Like you've just done a great job of putting a team together. And then last year, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, and the kid just can't lose. And what you guys were able to do in getting to the NFC Championship, and obviously 
something that was totally out of your control, put your team in a place where it's very difficult to beat someone like the Philadelphia Eagles with me now having to play quarterback because everybody was so banged up. <laughs> How much excitement, though, do you have heading into this year knowing that you guys, unlike all teams, like not every team knows that they can win it, knowing that you guys have an opportunity to do something extremely special here? So Kyle's dad, he's Mike, he's here a lot. Yep. And that's, and man, what an awesome opportunity to soak in his knowledge. I played for the man. And one thing he used to always say, guys, not everybody in this league has a chance. And he wouldn't tell you that every year, but he, on the right years when I was in Denver, he would say, guys, we have a chance. And that's all you can ask. Now it is what you make it. It's the ownership you take as a team. And we talk the same way to our players. And I do know we have a chance. Uh, we've, got, we've got the firepower to go get this done. Now it's what we make of that opportunity and it's breaks, it's staying healthy and all those things. But, um, you know, that's that's a lot of hard work and it's 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 uh, it's having an ownership who allows us to do things the right way. You know, one of the most important things I knew when we got here was that Kyle and I, we didn't we didn't really a lot of people assume we knew each other uh, for a long, long time. I played for his dad, but Kyle was off playing at Texas at the time. I really knew him from calling his games and spending time with him in production meetings. And Kyle and I would always kind of have really good conversations. He would ask, hey, can I not do it in person? I go home on Fridays to see my family, right. but I'll call you at 10 o'clock and, and we'll wrap as long as you want. And we'd end up talking for an hour, hour and a half. And so I started to, to really follow this guy. And, but when we got here together, we said, man, we, we gotta, we gotta, we have to be able to articulate what we build, what we believe builds a championship team. And we gotta challenge each other to do that. So we spent a lot of time, we brought a Stanford professor down. I had taken a class and this guy would make you do a vision statement for your life or a company. <laughs> And I said, Kyle, I know someone who can help us do this. And we sat in that draft room for hours upon hours. And it started with 10 people, you know, our trusted kind of right-hand men and all that. And it came, he kicked everybody out. It was just Kyle and I. And we came up with this for our first draft, this vision statement. And the great thing at a place like this, there was a, there was a roadmap because of people like Ronnie Lott and Keena mm -hmm. Turner and Steve Young and Joe Montana and Charles Haley. Um, so we knew the, about the 49er way, but we also know and knew that we couldn't rest on their laurels. We had to go recreate it because this place had gone. Yeah. And so we had to start bringing in and we just started at the, at the brass, brass tacks, you know, and let's go through every position. What are we looking for at this position? What are we looking at? And we got a really good profile. And I think when you do things together, and nowadays there's so many things at your disposal with technology and these R&D guys that are just brilliant, like, hey, my eyes are seeing this. Is that what the data is seeing? And there's a, there's a real good collective spirit of working together. And when you, when you have that, you can find the George Kittles mm. in the fifth round, the, the Fred Warners in the third round, the Dre Greenlaws in the uh, fifth, the Jawan Jennings in the seventh, because we're all speaking the same language and, and no one cares who gets the credit. I'll tell you, Right out here on on Brock Purdy, you know, I, th I think there's about three people who really get that credit, and in my mind, that it, it's Brian Greasy. He was a first year quarterback coach. Kyle had conviction. He played for his dad. Kyle had coached him a little when he was at Tampa, or had been on a staff. Kyle was like a quality control, and said, I, "And this guy's one of the smartest dudes I've ever been around." Brian comes and coach, and Brian just falls in love with this kid. We're going to take a quarterback late, or have a free agent that year. And uh, Brian, on these Zoom meetings, the play he really liked, but then on these Zoom meetings, just loved the kid. And, and he said there was this quiet confidence without the ego that, man, just impressed him. And he said, this kid's obsessed with, with winning. There's another guy, like people never hear these guys, Steve Slowick, uh, who had Iowa State. And he'd go in there and Matt Campbell, who's a, a really good source and done a heck of a job changing yes. that program. He would say, this guy changed this entire program. and. And people will say, if you're so convicted, why'd you draft him in the last pick of the draft? And they're, and they're right. I just say that to illustrate it takes everyone working together. And, uh, and you know, fortunately, we've had more hits than misses. But we also understand we've got a long way to go. You know, I didn't, I didn't come here and leave a good life just to put together good teams and get close. It, I did it to win the whole dang thing. And, and uh we're motivated to do that, and, and our players are motivated to do it. Making those hits are fun. You celebrate yeah. those. But, you know, you were in the locker room, you know, as a former player, you would see those guys taking a journey down the hall, you know, and how their livelihoods was affected. Now they got to, yeah. you know, relocate or what have you after their cut and release. 
How difficult is it for you when you have these guys come in, you establish relationships, and then sometimes it's a numbers game, sometimes it's you know injuries and all these different things. How difficult is it for you to have to make that call to say, hey, I got to let you go? Gut-wrenching. I, I just did it. One, one, one young man sat in that chair today, and he's a rookie free agent, and we got... We have some guys out on the D-line, and the kid's doing everything we're asking of them. And that's the hard part, when guys are doing everything you ask, but there's just circumstances. And we have to make a move, yeah. or we're getting too light at defensive end. And you bring the young man. I think the greatest lesson I learned, um, some places will have a younger scout do, do those duties, go get the playbook. Uh, Tony Dungy taught me. It's not going to make it easier, but at least they can understand if they get to talk to the people who are making the decisions. And so. Kyle's got a lot to do, but he'll hit most of them. I, I try to hit every single one of them uh, because if, if they can look at the guy who's making the decision, I can tell them, here's why we're doing this. And some guys, I, I have to have the un uncomfortable conversation that, hey, man, you, you may want to think about doing something else because you've got a lot to offer. I'm not sure it's in this. And that's uh, very seldom because you don't want to kill people's dreams. And I've seen people who you thought could never succeed come out of the ashes, but... I think when they can look in the decision maker's eyes, um, that goes a long way. And it doesn't make it any easier, but I think they can respect it and say, at least they look me in the eye on the way out. And so I've tried to do that the seven years here, and, and uh, that's something I'll never stop doing. One of the best conversations, football conversations I ever had was with his former coach, Tom Coughlin. Mm. Came to the New York Giants after my second year. I'd played a lot, nickel, dime, and I was really excited that the next year would be it for me. It's OTAs, and he sat in front of me and told me all of those things. He told me, you know, maybe it could happen for you on special teams. We don't necessarily think that you're ready to play the safety position for 16 games. And he, and he gave me all that through total honesty. And I was able to walk out with my head held high. I knew I had worked extremely hard, but I also knew he gave me some tidbits that if I could do these things, maybe I have another chance. And when I got my opportunity, no, there was a little bit of part of me that was like, I wanted to show him as well. But when I got the opportunity, I never forgot those things. I never forgot those notes. And I also never forgot his honesty. And forever, I will respect him for that. Because he wasn't saying it to be ugly. He was saying it because that was his truth. And I think the fact that you take that task as personally as you do is appreciated by all of those young men. I was going to ask, Coach, because you talk about, like, when you talk about football now, you've said data before. You yeah. brought a guy in from Stanford, a smart yeah. guy. He went yeah. to Stanford. But then, and and, and, and you're smart. not a dumb dude yourself. But then you also talk about, you know, the, there's analytics in it. But yeah. it's also the – you can see in the guy. The guy has his passion. You talk about how Sapp approached the game, how yeah. D. Brooks approached the game. The unquantifiable things mm -hmm. to a player. How – how much does that have to do? Because I can go run numbers. I know 40 times. I know bench presses. Yeah. You have to find more in a player that makes you draft them high and, like you say, make you have more hits than losses. There's something we rely a lot on at the at the uh, 49ers, and we call it wit, what it takes, you know, what it takes to win championships. And, you know, early on, I started saying we grade everything. If we're going to talk about wit all the time, let's put a grade to it. Nice. And so we put a grade to their wit. That's the... Uh, do they love football? Because you guys know it. The sport's too hard. If you don't love it, you're not going to succeed long term. Uh, maybe a couple players that didn't love football, but they love money. <laughs> they were really, they were really good. But there's uh, probably two of them that, that, that they're right here, and I won't say their names. Uh, but otherwise, it's too hard. You're not going to succeed. Are they dependable? Because we've been bit, and sometimes we're all product of our experiences, and you got to learn the hard way. You believe in someone, but they can't do the right things off the field. And so they're not going to be dependable or they're not going to protect your team on and off the field. Um, are they accountable? Are they going to show up on time? Some of those things can be learned. Mm -hmm. It's harder and harder because these kids are recruited heavily from a young age. Now with this NIL, they're recruited by their own coaches. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're ever told the truth because coaches have to worry about them transferring all the time. It is getting tougher and tougher. The greatest thing, though, man, it, it's easy to be a curmudgeon and say, man, we used to be like this. We used to. That's the thing I love about this thing. You guys saw our practice today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you tell me, Greg, Dre Greenlaw's not an old school guy. Yeah. Fred Warner's not an old school guy. Uh, Debo's not an old. I mean, and those guys, Trent Williams, they set the tone for the entire team. And so as many things that have changed, it still comes down to the to, to the same dang things. And And we talk a lot about, Kyle and I, we don't. We don't, as an organization, 
as a coaching staff, as a personnel staff, we don't miss on players on the talent because I think we go to great lengths to say exactly what we want at each position. When we miss, it's usually what we call that wit, both on field and off field. That's where you can miss. And, and um, you know, um, we take a lot of pride in that, bringing in the right type of people. What has been more satisfying for you, John? Is it the winning and the accomplishments of what I've put into it as a player? Yeah. Or now being in this position, being able to put together the type of vision that you want to see on the field and have it be successful. How do those things compare? Yeah, much like you probably are, Ryan. I've always I've always loved the game. I've always tried to be a student of the game. And then you start thinking, man, it'd be fun to try to put this puzzle together. So that's very challenging. Um, this is harder to me than playing. Playing, I didn't have success right away, and it took some time. And I, I would never disrespect the game to say it, it never did get easy. And I, I thought I, I, I lived in fear <laughs> that I was getting <laughs> cut, that I was going to get embarrassed. But this is tougher because there's there's somewhat of a lack of control. You you can lead, you can bring people together, you can bring in the right type of people, but then you got to let it go. Um, so I, I think building something. But to me, I think. One thing I know, this is a player's game, and you talk about making calls to people on draft day and seeing their family celebrate and seeing them weeping authentic and genuine tears and knowing their story and why they're feeling that emotion and then getting them to, to, to see the kids realize their dreams and what that does for their, their families and their kids and their kids' kids, and that's awesome to me, man. I love watching these kids, and then you know, there's a, there's a, we, we all always hear about the guys that are in trouble in this league. There are so many people in this league. Eric Armstead, what he's doing for our community right up the road in Sacramento, the things that guy does for the, he, he, he goes and reads to these kids. He buys books. He does classrooms. There's countless examples. We have community corners where these guys bring their charities out. It's an awesome thing, man. And so I get as much joy out of that as I do the wins and losses. And uh, it's, it's a bottom line league. And I understand that everyone's job depends on that. But but those things, it's a player's league. It always will be. And seeing these guys fulfill their dreams and in the same way, guys pour their hearts out that that maybe sometimes got to realize they got to hang it up. But say, you know what, you got a lot to offer in society, man. And don't ever forget that because so many of our players, they kind of get lost in that transition. But man, the one thing to tell them, you know how to work hard, you know how to be a great teammate. You know how to bring people together. Go use that in the world to make something special happen. And, uh, and you know, th those things are cool. The toughest or most frustrating part about this job? Kick off because there ain't a damn thing I can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I used to, you, you get those people, right? Like Brooks is on that. Sap, whether I want it or not, he's going to give it to me. And, yeah. and the first year they catch me and they catch me hitting the table and, and like, chill out, man. Like you've done your work, you know? And yeah. my dad would say the same thing. Have some poise. Don't let him see you sweat. Uh, <laughs> easy poise. to say, man. <laughs> easy to say, hard to do. You're so invested in this thing. But I, I think that, you know, you, you work really hard to, to, but man, come game time, there, there really is nothing you can do. And uh, that, we've, that's we've difficult. Seen you. That's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And um, I just want to add to that, two of the guys we've mentioned a few times on here who I actually text this morning to try and get some intel, yeah. Derek Brooks and uh, Warren Sapp. You know, I, I asked Sapp a funny story. He's like, I don't have any. <laughs> you know, he, he was our leader. You know, he set the tone for our defense. And uh, he spoke with his pads. He was our real leader, our true leader. And uh, I don't doubt that you are the same way here in this role. So I expect you to have as much success in that role as you did on the field as a player. Because you, you scared the shit out of me. <laughs> I, I definitely wasn't trying to right get back hit at by you. Man. <laughs> I wasn't trying to get hit by you. But, uh, uh, man, we appreciate your time. We know you're uh, busy. Let you me tell you one Warren Sapp story because this, uh -oh. is, this is a good one. Uh -oh. Because I'm telling you now, right now, those two guys and, and so many other teammates. But those two, if I needed them right now, I could call them and boom, the phone would drop and they'd be here. Mm. And Brooks, we were always good. And Sap and I started good. And uh, man, then it was, you know, there was the question you asked early. I mean, elephant in the room. Yeah, some people in the locker room said he's a rich white boy, you know. And, and uh, I was in a room where I was the one. And uh, Sap, Sap wanted to test me. And uh, I'll never forget, um, you know, he and I, like I said, we started good. We weren't having success, and Sap was being Sap. It's not always yeah. fun and roses. I mean, you walk by him, he's got a comment. You walk out, he's got a comment. 
we're on a game back. I forget where we were coming back from. And uh, there were a lot of hits in that game. We were, they were running power over and over and boom, boom, boom. And I had a hard head, but my head was hurting. So I'm on the plane and I'm doing this and something keeps hitting me ahead. <laughs> and they're cards. I see these cards are going down. And I finally just said, hey guys, man, like fellas, I'm not in the mood, man. My head hurts. We just lost, by the yeah. way. You guys are having a good party back there. We just lost a game. I'm tired of losing. Don't do it again. And boom. <laughs> and I got a good idea who it is, Warren. He's sitting on the on the other aisle, about three seats back. And so now I look back and I said, Sap, I think it's you. And if it happens again, I don't care how big you are. I will jump over this chair and I will whoop your you know what. <laughs> and Boom, he threw another card, boom, I leaped out and I came cocked and ready. And I'll never forget his eyes. He said, we good. <laughs> <laughs> I can ride with this guy. Ever since oh, yeah. then, we've been good. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. But you know, Warren, he's going to test everyone. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, yeah, he's going to test everyone. But I tell you, that's one of the most loyal human beings ever. And man, that guy, uh, he's a beauty, man. And he never changes. And I hope he never does because uh, he's, uh, he's always going to tell me the truth. And he also is always going to love me. And... And if I ever needed him, he'd be there just same same for Brooks. And man, we're gonna have so much fun. It's hard to leave your team when you're in this job, this time of year. Wow. Kyle came to my Hall of Fame two years ago and he said, dude, I know, I know uh, training camp's a hard time to miss, but don't you ever miss this. This is too special. And what makes it special is everyone coming back. And now we got a teammate going in and Rondé. Yeah. You led me to my last question. And in your speech, you mentioned Derek Brooks and where he was from. Yeah. You mentioned in your Hall of Fame speech, you mentioned Warren Sapp and where he was from. And obviously you just said, you know, I was the rich white boy. But your behavior, your interaction with everyone, it shows exactly what you said, that the locker room is a place we can all come together and work for one common goal no matter how we were raised and brought up. Can you just speak to a little bit of how that atmosphere has made John Lynch the man he is today. Yeah. I study it all the time. I'm like, why can't our world be like a locker room? Because we have fun. Some people will be the butt of jokes, but at the end of the day, we're all a brotherhood. And I think it, it, it's because our sport is so damn hard and it's so, it hurts. Everything about it's hard mm -hmm. that it really strips down barriers. And what we come to know is that we're a lot more alike than we are different. Mm -hmm. And I said it in my Hall of Fame speech because it, it was on my heart. We're having a lot of racial strife and all that. Man, I wish these people could experience a huddle. I wish they could experience a team uh, through the shared sacrifice, through the blood, the sweat, the tears the bond that that is created and i talk about it with sap and brooks i talk about it I, there's there's so many other teammates that i could talk about it but man i always feel really blessed that in that db room i was the minority but you know what they did they brought me in they accepted me they taught me and i am so grateful for that and it's just a great lesson that i think we can all apply to life and i i it really truly is one of the things i love about football i think it's ability to bring people together and i i really think it can be a model for for our society as a whole and uh Man, I, that's, that's why I love it when they're doing flag football, when they're doing football for girls, the more the better because I've seen so many positive stories of people who've come from nothing or people who have come from privilege, but then learned and did great things with it and didn't, and uh, man, it's an awesome thing. That's, that's why I love the game so much and why I can't quit it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. I know yeah. this is an important time of the year for you, but for us to get an opportunity to sit down, Hall of Fame player, obviously putting together a Hall of Fame GM career, but more so, a person. That's what this show is about, to show the many facets of people who play our game and live life the right way. So we're super grateful. Yeah, I'm equally as grateful. That's why I decided I, I don't do a lot there in training camp. Ryan asked me last year and Kyle and I have a deal. I kind of go away in the in the season. But uh, I did want to do this because I've got great respect for each of you, not only as players, but you guys do it the right way, man. And you, and you, you expose people to what it what the reality is. And, and uh, that's an awesome thing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, guys. Wow, it was yeah. dope, man. That was fun, man. We could have said it so much. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. Good scene. Hey, we'll tap back in after you guys win the Super Bowl. <laughs> I like go, man. Thank you so much, man. Do y'all own any Levi's? No. Jeans? Yeah. Oh, plenty. I get anything that's from Ross. If it's at Ross, it's in my closet. I went and got some shirts for the show today. I got 17 shirts. You know how much it costs? $51 for 17 shirts. <laughs> <laughs>
Fifty-one dollars <laughs> for seventeen shirts, bro. Buy them shirts. What's that? About seven dollars. Because you bro, got to put tax something. in there. It'd be something that's two dollars, something that's eight dollars. I ain't going double-digit dollars on a shirt. Though. And is it all t-shirts? All t-shirts okay. and some collars. Blanks. And some collars. No, it'd be just goofy stuff. It's like really he's doing an amazing job. I just look yeah. at the players on the field. You know, it's it's hard to find the players you guys have because you have to find some in the fifth. Right. You have to find something that they that have to hit on, and y'all yeah, have done a good job of that. George, what's up, bro? Oh, what's up, man? How you doing, <laughs> man? <laughs> hey, you know, listen, nice. you can do this now. You know what I mean? Nice. They never let me on the balcony when I played, though. <laughs> I don't want it. I don't want no parts of it no more, bro. No, you just want to go out there? No, I don't want it. No. No. <laughs> This is much better. I know. Your and body probably feels better, doesn't it? It does. Well, you know what? No, because that still takes its toll. <laughs> I, was, I was about to tell a lie. No, it doesn't. George, you got to bring the pivot to tight end you next year. Oh, yeah? We would love oh, that. Yeah, for sure. We would love that. With a Nashville. Speaking of tight end you. Hey, I heard you taught, uh, See him you taught on Kelsey the how to block. <laughs> He's getting some points. <laughs> yeah, you gave, you gave him some <laughs> That is something. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant.